he gets beaten up, he's in trouble, and then all of a sudden, well, he knew what was happening all along. And that's one of the reasons I like Sherlock Holmes. He's just in control. And so I'm never really concerned whenever I'm reading Sherlock Holmes because you have the confidence to know him that he's not going to get beat. He's just not. And you're trying to figure out the story even before he does, and I'm never able to do that. Uh, but Sarah is. She's got a gift for it. I, I don't know what that is. Probably increased intelligence or something. Uh, but, she, but she knows that sort of stuff. But I think the author of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, was kind of a master at working in uncertainty defeat and loss, and now in the end, showing how it all turned out for good. But you know what? Conan Doyle was not the only person to do this, not the first by a long shot. Mark, in recording the events of Jesus today, shows us through his life that through the ups and downs of his life, his ministry, the twists and the turns, the defeats and the quote-unquote failures, our Lord never lost control, not for one second. And we see this today clearly in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. And so what we're going to see here today uh, in our big idea is that we can have confidence in Jesus' control in a present, past, and future. Okay, where we are going today, confidence in Jesus' control of present, past, and future. And I think this is a message that we need. Okay, I was done with this message uh, by the time I heard the news about what happened in France. On Friday, and it's kind of in those moments you're like, man, is God, did you lose control for just a second? What's going on over there? It's just mass chaos. And now God had to remind me of everything He taught me then throughout the week about how God was involved in working in this world. And sometimes life just seems so chaotic. And even when something big like that doesn't happen, even just in the normal ins and outs of life, we can tend to think that God is forgotten or God is out of control, or maybe where our bodies just aren't working like they should. When we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, okay? And then, God, if you were just in control, you would take this from me. Or if we come back home uh, from work and we're just reminded of the troubles at our house, where we have a pile of unpaid bills, or a family member who is making bad decisions, or maybe just our life never turned out like we thought it would. God, are you in control here? Or maybe we're just lonely or grieving or depressed, and you think, God, if you were really in charge, that this would not be happening. Are you really there? Are you really in control? And these are the things that we grapple with as people, right? It's common to each of us, but as we study our text today, we see a Jesus that is completely in control. And though you may not understand why a certain situation is happening, it doesn't mean that he doesn't get it. He does. He is in control, and we can walk confident with him. Just as if you're reading Sherlock Holmes, you can be confident that Sherlock's going to get it at the end. Okay? God is in control. And so we've reached the point in the book of Mark where some of the things and stories are going to be a little bit more familiar. Okay? We've still got five chapters left in the book, but Jesus is in the last week of his life. Okay? So Mark spends a lot of time in the last week of his life. We're going to see things like today, the triumphal entry. No, it's not Palm Sunday, but we're doing it anyway. All right, and we're going to see things like uh, uh, Jesus cleansing the temple. We're going to see him betrayed and, and taken into a court. We're going to see him crucified and rise again, all in the last five chapters. But as Jesus enters the city where mass chaos is about to break loose, so we think, he shows us that he is in control. So let's look, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, and we'll see how Jesus is in control of the presence. Follow along with me. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of these standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told him whatever Jesus had said, and they let them go. I love how Mark presents the knowledge of Jesus here. What Jesus does is he goes to a city that he hasn't been to, the city that they're not in yet, sends his disciples and says, Hey guys, there's going to be a, a, a donkey right there, sitting at the entrance, okay? And yeah, he's going to be tied up. Oh yeah, I know about his history too. Nobody's ever ridden that donkey before. 
I also know that somebody's going to ask you about it, and here's the answer that you can give them to make it all okay, and they're going to let you take it. Because really, if you have your donkey sitting there and somebody says the Lord has need of it, are you, are you really going to say, well, well fine, <laughs> to just go take it? But here Jesus knows what he is doing, and he controls the situation. And frankly, I see this example of the story. Jesus has a lot of knowledge about something that is just ordinary. Right? Something that's mundane, something that's so little is just a donkey. And we tend to think of the knowledge of God, the control of God, as just the big stuff. Like, God knows uh, who the next president will be. Or God knows uh, what next law is going to be passed. Or maybe he even knows who's going to win the Super Bowl. Okay, not the Bears, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but God knows, okay? And Jesus' knowledge and control begins with the small things of life. Who cares about the donkey? Well, apparently Jesus does. He knows the ins and outs. He knows all the stuff that is going on with that little donkey. If he knows that, what do you think he knows about the big stuff in our lives? Yeah, he knows that too. Just put this into perspective into our world then today. What if we're on a road trip and we're about 20 miles outside of the city and I say to you, uh, you know what, as we're going into the city, Careful, there's going to be a dog crossing the street, and he's blind in his left eye. He's not going to see you, so you need to make sure that you break. Okay, and while you're doing that, roll down your window, because some guy's going to come up to you and say, thank you for slowing down for my dog. And by the way, he has bad teeth and is wearing purple pants. Okay, now what if, and you probably just roll your eyes at me if I said that, but what if we're coming into the city, and sure enough, a dog is walking across the street there, and you think, oh, he'll move. I'm a car, but he doesn't, so you remember what I say. Oh, slow down, he's blind in his left eye. Left eye. And all of a sudden, some guy that needs dental work comes up to you wearing purple pants and saying, Wow, thank you for stopping for my dog. You turn to me and be like, Let's go get a lottery ticket. All right? <laughs> Something like that, right? Okay, I know things, okay? Something special is obviously going on. And if I know stuff like that, who, who would you turn to for advice as you're leaving the city? Well, you probably talk to me about a few things that you need to do or what you want to know about. You would realize something special was happening here, and that has never happened. Made up story, okay, that was not me. But I think that's what Jesus is trying to teach the disciples here. Showing that, hey, I am in control, I know stuff. Because five days from right now, they're not going to feel like Jesus isn't much in control, right? When Jesus is being led away to be tried and betrayed by Judas Iscariot, when he's suffering under the leaders of the chief priest, Pontius Pilate, when he's being crucified on the cross, are they going to feel like he's in control? No, they're not. But what do they know going into it? Even though the outcome was difficult, Jesus had never lost control. And they didn't know what he was going to do in its fullest impact. They didn't know he was securing the sins, as, uh, the, the price for the sins of humanity there. But guess what? Jesus knew. Jesus was in control, and he had a point and a purpose to it all. He was in control of his present then, and he's in control of our present now. And that means that the things that are going on around you are happening under the control of Jesus Christ. Job 12. In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. You don't think God's involved in your life? It says he even controls the breath that is moving in and out of you. That is constant tension, constant control. So he is in control of our lives. But you know what? That's a difficult thing to grapple with because we suffer, don't we? We experience hard times, don't we? Do we not? Life well, can be very hard. And what's happening to you at the moment, in your wisdom, you can't fathom why in the world God is doing it that way. I mean, obviously, I would be doing something different. I'll admit that the last few weeks at our house has been a little bit like that. We've had kids and family members in and out of the hospital, okay? And we just wonder, okay, when's it going to stop? Okay, I'd probably do this differently. I'd rather not spend three, uh, four visits a week at the ER. That would be my preference, okay? <laughs> but that's not what happened. And then I know some of the stuff that you are going through right now, and it's even more difficult than that. But even though it's hard, even though it's difficult, has God lost control? Scripture would say not. And that's why God tells us, 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith as we live our lives and not by sight, because you know what? Our sight betrays us. We look around and we see things that we think are wrong, okay, the things that are broken, 
And we don't understand how God could possibly use that for good, as he says he will. And so we walk by sight so often, but Paul is urging us back to say, you know, walk by faith. And just because we can't feel or see why God is doing something, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a purpose to it. Because the disciples didn't get it either, and yet God was working a huge, great good in the world. And so the challenge from this for you and I is that when these things come up that want to doubt us to doubt God's control, that we don't turn to worry, or fear, or frustration, or complaining, but instead choose faith in the God who is in control, who says he can work it out. A few years ago, there was a documentary about great air disasters that happened in airplanes. Hey, it's really stimulating TV if you're going to go on an airplane. Uh, really. <laughs> and one of the stories reads this way that they tell in that show. It says an airliner had been flying along with everything appearing normal, and suddenly it began to experience all kinds of strange problems. It gyrated across the sky, plummeting thousands of feet at a time and turning violently to one side. One and then two of the four engines stalled and failed, leaving the plane without the power it needed to maintain level flight. The pilot and co-pilot responded instinctually, doing the best to right the course of the aircraft. Meanwhile, hundreds of passengers waited in abject terror, I have no doubt, uh, not knowing if they would live or die. The pilots fought valiantly and eventually found that they were able to control the plane. Mysteriously, the engines restarted and they were again able to provide sufficient power. The pilots redirected the plane to a nearby airport and landed safely. Only a handful of passengers experienced serious injury, though the plane sustained heavy damage from the immense loads placed on it during the erratic and who here wishes they were on that flight? Not me. But who were the hero in that, that part of the story? I mean, the pilots were. They wrestled control of this aircraft that was out of control. Or were they? The story <coughs> continues. In the aftermath, investigators found that almost everything that had gone wrong had been the fault of the pilots. When the plane encountered significant turbulence, the pilots should have responded according to the training, according to the plane's manual. Instead, they relied on instinct. And then when the plane began to experience further complications, the pilots ignored the instruments that should have directed them to the source of the problem and the straightforward solution. They swung the plane violently from side to side, attempting to ride it because they ignored the aircraft's instruments that told them where the horizon line was and how to keep the plane level. They ignored the instruments that told them that their engine problem was not as serious as they thought. Blinded by the stress of the situation, they ignored the manual and did things their own way. They very nearly cost them their lives and the lives of hundreds of passengers. They relied on instinct. They had the, the firm readings of the manual, the firm readings of the controls, the instruments right there. But when fear came up and worry came up that something was wrong, they took over and controlled it themselves. Ignored all the stuff that they had been trained on that they knew for certain and went and followed their instincts. We often made a mess in our lives where something happens and we think we need to clamp down and control the situation to respond and how we need to fix it and ignore what God says on the issue, ignore faith, ignore what is true in the situation, that he is working this together for a purpose. And when we do that, we short circuit what God is trying to do, and the problem gets worse instead of getting better. That's why God calls us back to faith. Because it's not going to feel like He's in control at that moment, but God says, Yes, I am. And that's when faith steps in and says, Yes, God, I believe. I believe. And plant my flag on that, and then we'll live according to it. Jesus is in control of my presence and yours. But the story continues on more about Jesus' control. Verses 7 and 8, we find that Jesus is controlled in the past. Let's look at verse 7. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And then Jesus is going to walk through with the crowds around him, shouting all these things into the city. Does that strike you as weird to anybody else? I mean, if this is the first time you're reading that, I mean, okay, why are people waving stuff? Okay, why is he on a donkey? Okay. And what's even more ironic is that this is the same Jesus, if you've been reading the book of Mark, 
who has spurned the spotlight his entire ministry. Okay? Let's just, if you don't believe me, Mark chapter 1, verse 34. You don't have to turn to him. It says, Jesus healed many who were sick, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. They wouldn't, he wouldn't let him speak about the truth of who he was. Chapter 3, verse 12. He strictly ordered them not to make him known. Chapter 7, verse 36. I think it's in my Bible. There it is. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. Chapter 8, verse 30. And he strictly charged them to tell no one. Chapter 9, verse 9. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen. All throughout Mark. God, Jesus has been keeping the mystery of who he was a bit of a secret. And now all of a sudden, he shows up on a donkey in a spotlight, proclaiming himself all through the city. What is going on? Well, to understand what is going on, you have to know your Old Testament. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he humble and mounted on what? A donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Here God is making a prophecy written 550 years before Jesus shows up here. 550 years before this, and saying that when this guy shows up mounted in the fold of the donkey, he's going to be the king. His kingdom is coming, and he's going to have salvation. And so what is Jesus <laughs> wanting the crowd to see whenever they, he shows up on this donkey? He wants them to remember Zechariah 9 and 9. And remember that he is bringing salvation. And why did he wait? He did it so he would be unveiled as king and messiah to the whole nation of Israel. Because this was Passover time, okay, when he shows up in Jerusalem. And Passover is one of the biggest holidays in Israel, and it means that Jews from around the world would gather there at that week. It was the perfect time to tell, to reveal who he was. I mean, say you're a store owner and you've got merchandise you want to sell. All right, now, you could put it on sale tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock, or you can wait till Black Friday. Okay, which one's going to give you the bigger return? Black Friday, right? Everybody's going to be out shopping. That's where the people are. And so Jesus, in essence, unveils himself in Black Friday. <laughs> Everybody's there. Everybody is out there. And the whole nation saw him entering Jerusalem in fulfillment of this prophecy written 550 years before. Can you see the control of Jesus here? That he not only had to be in control in the presence, he also had to be in control when Zechariah was alive 550 years before, knowing that Jesus could do this, knowing what needed to be written. Because Jesus was in control not just today or yesterday, but 550 years before that, and 2,550 years before that. He has always been in control. Let's just make one application from this. I've been a old, I'm old enough now to look back at my life and see some things that maybe I regret doing, okay? Just would like to have done differently. And if I would have done it differently, then maybe things would have turned out a little bit different. I think all of us have that, right? Is this, I don't think it's just, just specific to me. Things we wish would have turned out differently are choices that we made which would have been done another way. But for some of us, the guilt of those moments can weigh us down, even up to today. It just feels heavy. We wear it so intensely and feel so guilty about it. But was God in control then as he is now? And is God powerful enough to even use your failings, to even, even use your goof-ups, to even use your sin, and somehow turn it out for good? Yes, he can do that. He is in that sort of control. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he promises, that, promises you that that is happening. And therefore, the guilt that we carry about those past events isn't just unhelpful. I believe it's wrong. Because we're holding ourselves something to ourselves that God does not. Psalm 103, through 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Praise God for that, right? Where would we be without that? But even though God has removed the transgressions from us, the sin from us, and healed us, he's removed it. Sometimes we like to bring it a little bit closer. We like to... We wrestle, make ourselves somewhat feel better by feeling guilty about it because we think we've got our just desserts for some reason. But that's a twisted way of viewing things in a way that God does not. 
And in essence, you take God's place in your life as judge of your life whenever you choose to feel guilty to the point of destruction over the things of the past. And that is not a good spot to be. In Jesus, we can have forgiveness from sin. And once he's removed it from us, it is forgiven. It doesn't mean that all the consequences are gone, but we are forgiven. But I've seen so many crippled by guilt in their lives that it keeps them from serving the Lord as they ought to in the present. Is that what God would have for us? No. He has forgiven to us. He is in control of the past as he is the present. We can cling to his forgiveness. So let's get back to our text. We've seen Jesus control the present, the past, and now the future. Verse 9. And those who went before him and those who were followed him shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. The crowd seems to get what Jesus is doing here. Hosanna means Lord save. Okay? Kind of points to the salvation the message that they were looking for from Zechariah 9.9. 9. They seem to get it. They accept that Jesus' kingdom is coming and that their king, the Messiah, is here. And wouldn't you love it if the story ended right there? <laughs> but Jesus came, they accept, accepted him, and now he lives and rules and reigns. But that's not what happens. Though the crowd is shouting Hosanna now, in just a few short days, they're going to be shouting something very different. Mark chapter 15, verse 12. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? That's Jesus. And they cried out to him, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy who? The crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. There's another irony in the text here. The ones that you think would have had Jesus back were the ones that were shouting, Hosanna. And just a few days later, their shouts have turned to say, crucify him. Wow. But does Jesus turn the camel around knowing that that's going to happen? No. He keeps going. He knows what's going to happen. He's control of, in control of past, present, and future. And it's said that Jesus, in Hebrews chapter 12, went to the cross for the joy set before him. The joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He knew it was coming, and yet he did it anyway. He's in control of the future, just as he is in the past and the present. But yet, and I speak from experience in my own life, what's one of the things is that's the most scary for some of us in here. The uncertainty of the future, the mystery of the future. But is it a mystery for our Lord? No. He knows it all. God tells Israel, a very neat verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. And neat seems like a very much an understatement here. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Did Jesus know the future of Israel? That's where he's going. He's taking the future and a hope. Does he know the same for us? Yeah, the New Testament affirms it all over the place, that for believers in Jesus Christ, things are working together for good. He's molding us to stand before him to receive our inheritance from him and the joy of eternity. He knows where he is taking us. He knows the future. He affirms it again and again and again. And everything in our lives is pointing towards that moment if you're in Christ to stand before him. Do we need to scare, be afraid of the future? No. That too is in the hands of the Lord. So we've seen Jesus in control of the past, the present, and the future. Now, as he shows us this in Mark chapter 11, what response do you think God wants from me and you today? I think he wants us to have confidence. I think he wants us to trust him. That whatever is happening in our, in our lives, that he has never left control, not even for one moment. And he is working this for a purpose and a point. We can trust him. And imagine waking up every day in full confidence of what God is doing in your life and in this world. Is in control. And of course, I know that things pop up in your mind of all the reasons that you think he's not. You could point to this and to that and to that hard situation. And so you can consider those things, but I trust Jesus' perspective a bit more than my own or a bit more than yours. 
Because we don't see how God is working this good. We don't understand it because we are limited. We walk by sight so much and not by faith, and we just don't get it. But I trust the God who knows where a donkey is in his past history, even though he's a few towns over. I know a God who can prophesy 550 years about something very specific and to plan what's going to happen. I know and trust the God who's going to go to the cross, a future assured, knowing that good is going to happen. That's who I trust. And if we keep in mind the truth of what God says that sustains us whenever we're tempted to worry, be frustrated, and complain. But sometimes we just want to wrestle those controls back to God, where he says, I'm in control all so the challenge that is today is to trust. Don't let yourself go to worry, to fear, frustration, complaining. Because honestly, that's easier, isn't it? Yeah? It's just easier to let ourselves go. But what's more rewarding and what's more freeing to trust the Lord in everything that he is doing? So as we close, consider the stresses. Consider all the things that are difficult and wrong. And apply the truth that God is in control and trust Him in those moments and let Him sustain you through every moment. And even though we don't get it, be grateful that we don't if we can trust a guy in this. Because that's one of my most grateful memories just as a kid. It's just growing up, I have parents who are faithful believers who love me very much. And I didn't know anything what was going on in my life. I was oblivious. But my parents always did. And they always did what was best. And they always took me to where I, I needed to go and provided everything that I needed. I think God uses that as a model for what he is like to his people. That even though we don't get it, he is in control. We can't trust. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this challenge. Lord, it's one that I needed. Lord, maybe it's one that somebody else in here needs today too. But Father, we just are so tempted to look and see how you can be in control when we see the stress of life, the hardship, the sin, the suffering around us. But Lord, that does not change the fact that you are in control. You are working in this world in ways we don't understand. And Father, may we give up trying to. Father, may, may we acknowledge the end of ourselves and see how the beginning of you is far, 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 far bigger. And Lord, we know that you are working good in this world. You tell us. Lord, you show us. May we and as we trust, I pray that you would just allow that just to work in people's hearts and lives as they have the